In part one of this video lecture, I talked about philosophies of social reform in the British trajectory, most notably focusing on John Stuart Mill and his utilitarian-inspired philosophies. Also within the British trajectory of social philosophy, but very much taking a very different tack, was Karl Marx. Karl Marx was German, but he lived most of his life and did most of his writing in England. Before we go any further, do understand that pretty much everything you think you know about Karl Marx is wrong. Well, except maybe that he had a beard, because he did have a beard. But a century of misinformation about what Marx actually wrote and advocated for has given people false impressions. Much of that false information about Marx came from those who claimed to be instituting his ideas, but in fact were not. There has never truly been a Marxist society, and no, the communism of the Soviet Union or China were not true to Marx's philosophy. They were very different. But another huge chunk of that false information about Marx and his ideas came from the capitalist whom Marx opposed and who wanted to stamp out Marx's critique of capitalism. And that's really what Marx is doing with his social philosophy, critiquing capitalism declaring that it is a affront to and violation of human nature. Karl Marx didn't invent the idea of communism. The idea of communism, after all, comes from the Latin communis, which means communal. The idea of communism is the idea of a communal society, which is variously interpreted throughout history, that is in contradistinction to a hierarchical society dominated by an elite class. Karl Marx and his companion in philosophy and publishing Friedrich Engels were discussing an emerging philosophical idea that on the basis of then contemporary events they thought was about to become the major political and social philosophy in Europe. Marx's goal was to understand both the movement he thought he saw coming and the broken social political system that the movement was opposing. It is important to realize that Marx and Engels, like all philosophers, did not think in a vacuum. They were thinking in a community. They were thinking within history. Europe in the 1830s and 1840s was seeing a escalation of worker and peasant dissatisfaction, which led to open revolts in numerous countries in numerous periods. This culminated in 1848 that has come to be known as the Year of Revolutions. And it was in 1848 that Marx and Engels wrote the infamous Communist Manifesto, thinking that this was what history was leading to. And Marx and Engels were thinking this way because they were Hegelians. George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel had argued that history is a process, a unfolding of rational history, an unfolding of a rational pattern of events. History is developing along rational lines, and Marx believed that he saw the pattern. He wrote with Engels in the Communist Manifesto that the history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggles, freeman and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guildmaster and journeyman, in a word, oppressor, and oppressed. These stood in constant opposition to one another, carried on an uninterrupted, now hidden, now open fight. A fight that each time ended either in the revolutionary reconstitution of society or in the common ruin of the contending classes. History showed, or so Marx and Engels claimed, that the rich exploit the poor. Always have. Society has always been divided into a small, wealthy elite and the poorer masses. Marx and Engels aren't making that up. That's true. In Marx's time, the divide was between the capitalists, who owned the means of industrial production, and the workers who owned nothing, and were, therefore, forced to sell their labor to survive. The capitalists, Marx argued, were profiting from the labor of the workers, the rich exploiting the poor through the system of capitalism. For Marx, then, human history is economic history. Humans need to satisfy their material needs, 
Therefore, they are dependent on the forces of production that satisfy those needs. In the capitalist era, of which Marx was living, that exchange is an exchange of labor for wages, and that is the only way that someone who is without property can survive. History is a class struggle, and the class struggle in Marx's time was seen as the struggle between the bourgeois class, the capitalist factory owners, and the proletariat, the working class. The bourgeois class control the means of production, including farm fields, mines, and factories from small to large. The workers own nothing and must sell their labor. And because the working class have no power in this transaction, or very little power, they must accept whatever terms and wages dictated by the capitalists. In 1848, Marx and Engels thought that they were seeing the impending collapse of capitalism, just like earlier systems of economic exchange had collapsed. Slavery had collapsed, replaced by a revolution, and morphed into feudalism, and feudalism collapsed and morphed into capitalism. Next, capitalism will collapse from the weight of its supposed rational contradictions, which will make it unsustainable. And the collapse of capitalism will usher in the next economic epoch, when the class divide will finally end, and society will be without rational contradictions. At least, that's what Marx predicted. Why did Marx and Engels think that capitalism would collapse? Marx said, specifically, that it is filled and riddled with logical contradictions. Capitalism, he said, is an economic system defined by bourgeois property. How Marx and Engels are defining bourgeois private property is important. They saw it as a very particular type of property that is the final and most complete expression of the capitalist system of exploitation of the many by the few. It's crucial to understand what Marx and Engels did not mean by bourgeois private property. They explain it in the Communist Manifesto. We have been reproached with the desire of abolishing the right of personally acquiring property as the fruit of a man's own labor, which property is alleged to be the groundwork of all personal freedom, activity, and independence. Hard-won, self-acquired, self-earned property. Do you mean the property of the petty artisan and of the small peasant, a form of property that preceded the bourgeois form? There is no need to abolish that. The development of industry has, to a great extent, already destroyed it, and is still destroying it daily. Or do you mean modern bourgeois private property? But does wage labor create any property for the laborer? Not a bit. It creates capital for the capitalist. Marx never was against free enterprise of the subsistence farmer who owned his farmland of the artisan who owns his shop and the goods that he produces, because that's not bourgeois property. Bourgeois property is industry that is destroying the small producers, destroying the petty artisans, and destroying the small farmers. Indeed, this was an historical reality in the 1800s and, and is still a reality today. The economic power of large-scale industries and corporations drives private industry out of business. The factories drive the small artisans out of business, the small artisans now being essentially unemployed and unable to make a living have to now convert to the proletariat, selling their labor for mere wages. This capitalist system does not create property for the laborer. The system creates capital for the bourgeois class. Capital is money, yes, but it's more than that. It's power, a social power that affects government, economics, and other aspects of society. Capital, in Marx's and Engels' critique, is independent. It has a form of individuality in itself, where the living person, the worker, is dependent and has no individuality. Marx and Engels in the 1840s here are referring to the emergence of the corporation, 
a social institution that was originally developed in the 1600s with the express purpose of creating capital for its investors. Corporations began to proliferate in the early 1800s, and Marx and Engels were prescient in their description of capital having individuality, because 18 years after they published the Communist Manifesto in the year 1866, the United States ratified the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. That amendment, affirmed by multiple Supreme Court decisions, recognized a corporation as a natural person, giving corporations as many rights, if not more rights, than individual people naturally have. Marx and Engels were also prescient in that today, the power of corporations dominates economic, social, and political life. The bourgeois system, the capitalist system, is the private ownership of the means of production that splits society into the classes of bourgeois and proletariat. One could argue, truthfully, that people who are working for a corporation are compensated in the form of wages. But Marx interestingly argued in his book Das Kapital, published in 1867, that all wages within capitalism are inherently corrupt and exploitative. Marx's basic philosophical argument is simple and eloquent and shows one of the key differences between capitalism and free enterprise. Capitalism is the exploitation of the surplus value produced by labor. And here's what that means. In free enterprise, where the worker, for example, a blacksmith or a tailor or a shoemaker, owns the means of his or her own production. The worker also owns the goods that are the products of his or her own labor and can sell those products and keep all of the revenue and then decide what they wish to do with that money. In capitalism, the bourgeois capitalist owns the means of production but does not work. The capitalist hires others to perform the labor needed to produce goods. The workers do not own the product of their labor. The capitalist does, who then can sell the product, because they own it, and keep all of the revenue. But to make a profit, after subtracting other fixed costs, the capitalist has to pay the workers less than the value of their labor. That's Marx's argument. In a 12-hour workday, which was common in the 1800s, the worker, Marx says, is paid wages, but only the equivalent value of around eight hours of work. The value of the other four hours of work is pocketed by the capitalist as profit. And that is why, he argues, the capitalist work relationship is not equal. It is inherently exploitative. The wages worker receives from the capitalists are not a fair exchange for the value of the labor produced. Marx claimed that in the capitalist system, instead of working only for yourself, you're really only working partially for yourself. You are mainly working to make profits for the capitalist. The worker doesn't receive a fair wage for his or her labor, and in the capitalist system never will. This is one principal corruption of the capitalist system, Marx claimed, and a major reason why capitalism is doomed to failure, because eventually this inefficiency of the system will cause it to collapse. But why is it inefficient? What is the inherent problem here? For Marx, this is an injustice, not just a sense of I don't get paid enough, which is certainly an aspect of the dissatisfaction of the working class, but the capitalist system harms human beings on a very deep level. Even the capitalist who benefits most from the exploitation of the proletariat class is harmed in the capitalist system. The capitalist is trapped by the system, as are the workers. The capitalist is in continual competition with other capitalists, their business competitors, and the capitalist is driven to make more profits so that the profits can be invested to grow the means of production to make more profits, to grow more means of production, and so on and so on. It is, Marx says, accumulation for the sake of accumulation, production for the sake of production. This is what characterizes bourgeois capitalism, Marx says. And indeed, we still see this today in corporations that 
are obsessed with the quarterly report of not just are we making a profit, but are we making enough profit, and is profit continually increasing? It is accumulation for the sake of accumulation. Marx says that this means that the capitalist system has an inherent need to exploit labor, to drive down workers' wages as much as possible to increase profits. And it is the worker who suffers the most from this, because the worker is treated as a stupid machine. It throws a section of the workers back into barbarous types of labor, and it turns them into machines. It produces intelligence, but for the worker, stupidity, ignorance. In this system, workers suffer not just economic deprivation, but also a kind of spiritual alienation. In Marx's early writings, now known as the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844, he wrote that the forms of alienation suffered by the proletariat were alienating them from their own humanity. Now, Marx never published these. They were found only years later. And it shows another side of his philosophy about which few people knew and still don't know today. And most tragically, the early Marxists, or those who thought they were Marxists, also did not know of these ideas that Marx had. For example, the Russian Bolsheviks, who only knew about Das Kapital and Communist Manifesto, developed their own sense of a pseudo-Marxism that was based entirely on economic and political analysis without the human aspects of Marx's earlier writings. In those earlier writings, Marx said that the irrational nature of the capitalist system causes estrangement or alienation for the workers in four ways, all of which stem from the fact that in capitalism's system of production, labor is external to the worker. If one has the opportunity to work for oneself, one's work is a personal expression. Marx, more than 150 years ago, was much more familiar than we are today with independent craftspeople who owned their own workshops, producing their own goods to sell, what he called petty artisans, petty only because they're small. Marx said the work of such belonged to their intrinsic nature, and their work affirmed who they are as human beings. But the opposite is true in capitalism. In capitalism, work is just a job. It is external to one's intrinsic nature. You go to your job, at which you are unhappy, because the labor is not an expression of who you are. It is not an activity that develops you mentally or physically. And these facts cause the first two forms of alienation. Marx said that workers are alienated from the product of their own labor. They don't own the means of production. A craftsperson does. And therefore, they own the products that they produce. But workers in capitalism do not own the means of production. And therefore, the bourgeois property owner who owns a factory owns the goods that are produced by the factory. The products of the worker's labor are owned and controlled by the factory owner, who is free to sell and profit from what the labor of others have produced. The workers have no control, no ownership of the product of their labor. Yes, the worker receives a wage, but as Marx explained, the wage is not fair compensation for the worker's labors. Second, workers are alienated from the process of production. Workers have no say in the process of production. They are merely used by it. They are machines operating machines. The entire work process is fully external to the worker. To manufacture products, factories require the commodities of raw materials, the commodities of the machinery that produces the materials, and the commodity of workers to run the machines. And on the job, workers are not people. They are interchangeable parts, mere commodities. But still today, business refer to workers not as people, really, but as human resources, showing that workers are just so much fungible raw material to be used by the company or corporation as it sees fit and for the benefit of the corporation. 
Marx identifies a third form of alienation in that workers are alienated from their own human nature, and this is a direct result of the first two forms of alienation. Workers are human beings, but capitalism, just plain, does not treat them as human beings. They are, after all, just resources, commodities. Marx claimed that the nature of human beings is to be free and consciously active. And as many other philosophers have acknowledged, we have our own will, and Marx says that our conscious life activity distinguishes us from the animals. We have free will. We can do things. Animals act only to satisfy their own immediate needs, but we humans can create for purposes beyond our immediate needs, and we see ourselves in the world that we create. The capitalist system of production, though, strips all of that creative activity away from workers. The capitalist system objectifies workers, turning them into mere beasts of burden, but actually making them lower than beasts of burden because the capitalists, Marx says, spend no effort to care for and feed the workers. And think about this. This is an interesting point that Marx makes. The bourgeois property owner feeds and takes care of his horses, but expects his workers to fend for themselves. Here's your wages. Go off. Find housing. Find food. Find clothing yourself. Workers are forced to work to sustain their physical bodies. They literally work to eat, to survive. Work, therefore, in the capitalist system is forced labor that is merely a means to satisfy needs external to that work. The height of the worker's servitude is that it is only as workers that they can maintain themselves as material beings, and that it is only as material beings that they are workers. They are no longer human beings, no longer engaged in creative activity, or, as Marx extolled, the idea of working to create something that is part of your conscious life activity. No. In capitalism, we work for somebody else. It is just a job. Finally, the fourth form of alienation is that workers become alienated from each other because of the capitalist system. Workers not only are degraded below being human, below animals, but also are forced to see other workers as degraded to that level. In the servitude of the proletariat, workers are alienated from their employers, but also alienated from their fellow workers. That's because capitalism has reduced them to fungible commodities. They're replaceable. Don't like your job? I'll get somebody else to do it for you. And therefore, workers are forced to see their fellow workers not as allies, but as competitors, indeed almost enemies, for the finite number of jobs that are available. Marx also saw that the capitalist system of production created competition among workers that incentivizes workers to work for less money than their peers, thereby driving down wages and making everyone, all workers, worse off. But far worse in Marx's mind is that this competition turns workers into mutual threats to each other, almost enemies. The other worker could be willing to work longer hours and or for lower wages. Therefore, one's fellow workers are potential adversaries. In this, Marx was hardly alone. James Mill had written in an essay in 1813 about the plight of the factory worker. James Mill almost poetically sympathized with the worker whose, in Mill's words, eyes were exclusively fastened day after day, upon one and the same narrow circle of objects and operations, while their minds had access to an even smaller number of ideas. There was a growing awareness in 1800s social philosophy that the Industrial Revolution was dehumanizing humanity. On these matters of the alienation of the workers, Marx was largely correct, and indeed we can still see that Marx's ideas about the alienation of capitalist labor is still true today. We still, a lot of us anyway, have to work merely to survive. Work is just a job. We don't work for ourselves. We work for a corporation. We don't identify with the work that we do, and we don't own the products that we may produce. 
and this is true not just of factory laborers. The worker at the coffee shop does not own the coffee machine, does not own the restaurant, does not own the coffee. Many philosophers today still talk about this alienation that our modern society instills within human beings. On that, Marx was correct on a kind of inherent exploitation of labor by the capitalists. He was correct. Marx thought that these alienations and the other rational inconsistencies within capitalism would lead to its demise. Workers would eventually become so alienated that they had nothing left to lose. They would revolt. The workers' revolution would topple capitalism a capitalism that was slowly destroying itself through its inefficiencies, through its incessant need to continually exploit labor, its incessant need to continually compete with fellow businessmen. Marx thought that this inevitability was right around the corner. Capitalism was doomed to fail, and it would fail soon. And this would bring in a new epoch of the workers owning the means of production. That's where he kind of ended his philosophy. The workers won't be alienated from the labor because they control the means of production. They're working for themselves. They will own the factories. They will own the mines. They will own the railroads. They will own the farms. And therefore, everything will be fine. And this was one aspect of Marx's blindness. There were a lot of things in which Marx was correct, but there were a lot of things in which Marx was just plain blind about. The vision of a worker's paradise is an overarching optimism that just plain doesn't work. Marx believed that greed and selfishness were not a natural part of human nature, but they were emotions created by society, by capitalism. And when capitalism is destroyed, human behavior will change because the capitalist economic system will no longer determine human behavior. It will not make workers compete with each other. It will not produce alienation within workers, within people. And history shows us that human nature is not as communally minded as Marx had hoped. Now, the world has never seen a communist society. The revolutions that claimed to be communist, claimed to be Marxist, in the Soviet Union, China, and Cuba were very quickly hijacked by leaders who remained permanently stuck in a temporary stage of we need to wipe out capitalism before we can hand the means of production over to workers, which never happened. They created political dictatorships, Lenin, Mao, Castro, among others, and clung to power, continually claiming that the workers' revolution against the capitalists was not over, and they had to keep control. The fault in these failed states wasn't communism or socialism, because those states never got to those points. They were ironically more capitalist than anything in their exploitation of workers. And Marx didn't seem to consider that a possibility, that someone could hijack from workers the so-called workers' revolution and just inflict a new right-wing totalitarian state. Like, like Hobbes in his political philosophy, Marx didn't take into account how much power corrupts. Another problem that Marx never explains is how this new communal society of workers controlling the means of production would work. How do the workers control the means of production? To say that workers will now make political and economic decisions doesn't explain the mechanism by which they do so. Marx seems to be relying on the assumption that absent class struggle everyone will be eager to cooperate. Soviet propaganda films played heavily on the theme of the happy peasants, the happy workers, joyously working. But these expressions of ideology never dealt with the realities of life. How do worker-run farms, mines, and factories govern themselves? How do they conduct business? How do these separate communities interact and work together? Worker ownership is a great idea. But how does the communal society not slip into the mode of businesses competing against each other that has become a part of capitalism? 
How can worker-owned businesses avoid being taken over by selfish and exploitative people? That's why Marx insisted that capitalism must be completely destroyed in order to improve the plight of the working class. But he was wrong, perhaps because he was a determinist, believing that economic factors forced capitalists to behave only in very predictable certain ways, and workers also in very particular predictable ways. Marx did not foresee the possibility of organized labor unions that could take action to better their lives short of violent overthrow of governments, short of killing all the capitalists and taking the factories by force. Marx also could not imagine that some capitalists could have genuine concern for workers' well-being and were willing to work together with their employees to improve everyone's lives. Rather than war, cooperation is possible. Marx did not understand that, and neither have many of his hardcore followers up until today.